you know, what are, uh, perhaps start with you, Richard, what are the priorities you need to see uh, in this new strategic bodies, uh, sub-national transport bodies, apologies, um, uh, priority list? And are there some specific projects that you need to get in there? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think for us, uh, as I mentioned, um, half of the, the cross-channel trade, that 210 billion third of the UK's trading goods is actually going beyond London to support economic activity in the Midlands and the North. So actually for us, the Lower Thames crossing is absolutely key to make sure that that, that half of that trade can actually free flow to support those economic regions. Um, but then I think off the back of that, as I say, you're only as good as the weakest link. And actually, what we need to do is look at how some of these investments affect other parts of the transport network. So Lower Thames Crossing, great, we really support it. But that, that's actually going to push, I think some consultants have said, about 9% more traffic down onto the M280 route mm -hmm. down to Dover. Uh, if you're doing that, and you've got five miles of single carriageway that currently can't cope, um, you're going to have even, even, an even bigger problem. So what we need to do is dual those last five miles uh, to Dover so you've actually got two resilient routes to, to Europe's busiest uh, okay. gateway. Dave, what about yourself? What are your what, what, I suppose general priorities and specific schemes? Yeah, I think the, uh, the priorities are headlined that the, uh, the three ports are all geographically very closely located, all of them located along the, uh, the M27. So from my perspective, given that we've got goods and people travelling on those to each and every single one of those ports, providing improvements to the resilience of the, uh, the M27, whether that be through uh, further development of the M27 beyond smart motorways, junction improvements, et cetera, or indeed railway improvements, which will thereby mean that there is greater free flow, going back to, uh, to Richard's point, um, to each and every single one of those ports is going to be key both for exporting, but also importing goods and people into uh, our country. Okay, and Ed Edward, what about yourself? You mentioned, um, obviously, the, uh, the need for uh, electric charging infrastructure, but you know, what are the priorities, I suppose, the general priorities and then the specific schemes that you want to see? I mean, I think the general priority is, is to make sure that we've got the right overarching framework for the South East, uh, that we've heard how powerful a, an area it is, uh, I see that as a, a, a key task for the transport for the South East. Specifically, then, mine become really quite local. Uh, I can think, I already mentioned the A27, for example, huge issues around Chichester uh, and the M3 as well. So the strategic road network, we've got to get rid of those pinch points. We've got to get the, uh, get the road network free-flowing um, and get a bit more predictability back in. That's what undermines uh, the confidence of the user is... They can't predict what's going to happen. Okay, yeah. uh, Anthony, just, just expanding on, on, on the, what we talked about earlier, do you think that with the emergence of more of these subnational transport bodies uh, actually really uh, in, in, engaging with local populations, that uh, as, as this happens, that you will, we will need a, uh, a watchdog which looks after the local roads? Because, you know, you, you, know, you look at uh, you know, the impact that it has on buses, which are a fundamental part of the transport network. You know, should you be starting to, to, to be the watchdog? We stand ready to be asked. Right. Uh, that, uh, I think, what, so what, what needs to happen to make, that, to make that a reality then? Well, change legislation and a bit of money. That's all. Right. <laughs> but but you, will you, will, is that something you'll be lobbying for? Them? Uh, no, it's not our job to lobby to extend our own powers. It's for government to decide. But it does seem logical that you fill in the gaps in the transport network and given the reliance mm. on buses, on local roads that work, I think mm. it's very, very important. Ed, Ed, would you be lobbying for that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, clearly... I, I'm interested in anything that can help achieve that network that has much mm. greater resilience and allows us to actually deliver, you know, a high quality, effective local transport network, because that's what's going to support all the economic growth that we've heard so much about today and which mm. is such positive news. Well, David, I mean, reality, I mean, how much, as, you know, as a member of the business community, how much, how much influence do you think you're going to have on a body like the transport for the South East? Well, I think the key thing is if um, you know businesses like ourselves absolutely need to have a voice, um, whether it be individually, whether it be through the the local enterprise partnerships, because ultimately we do want to have a, a single voice. I can't remember who it was this morning was saying the most effective uh, outcome we could have. I think for transport for the uh, the southeast would be to have a single voice. Okay, question here with the floor. Here, far away. Just say who you are and uh, far away. Thank you, Michael Payne, Kent County Council. Richard, I'm slightly disappointed that you failed to take the opportunity to let people know that 20% of England's banana imports come in through Dover. <laughs> <laughs> apart from... How, how many is that? <laughs> 
Well, apart from wanting to know where the other 14% come into the country, um, what I was pleased to say ser uh, here seriously was that you mentioned the elephant in the room, which is Brexit, uh, because uh, it is going to add to the stress on our highways and on your business. And I'm pleased to say that in terms of strategic priorities for the transport for the southeast, Lydon Junction Dueling and Bentley Corner are added to the list. And I think this is an example of how Transport for the South East, working with business, working with local authorities, can give a result. So, Richard, not the first time we've had bananas and Brexit in the same sentence, but uh, what do you think? Absolutely, and they both begin with B. Uh, it's 25%, uh, just to be clear of the, uh, the UK's imports, a little soundbite there. Um, but, yeah, ab absolutely. I think Transport for the South East, working with the local authorities uh, and, and businesses like ourselves, is absolutely key to give sa the South East a very clear voice at this really critical point in our nation's history. I mean, the South East and Kent in particular are absolutely this, this pinch point between the rest of the UK as a trading centre and our largest trading partner, the EU. If we don't get the South East right, the rest of the UK isn't right. So I think that's a really strong message for us to be able to push in terms of getting the right investment we need at this point in time. Dave, what, what's, your, what's your Brexit view? Um, from an airline perspective, I mean, it's still very much in the, uh, the mix at the moment. Uh, I suppose my aspiration, uh, not surprisingly as an airport operator, is that there will be a resolution. Um, will people still be able to fly to uh, other parts of uh, Europe? Um, post um, you know, introduction of uh, Brexit, I still believe they will. I think some of the challenges will be for the airline community in terms of flying within Europe. Um, and you've seen probably some changes in terms of EasyJet getting their own operating license in Europe now, and uh, a Polish carrier, Wiz, now getting their own uh, operating license within the UK. So people and airlines are very adaptable. I think it's fair to say, and people will have seen how technology's changed. So do I feel confident that airlines will adapt to the new operating environment? Yes, I do. Question here, yeah. Uh, Mark Sullivan, um, I think uh, I, I just compare uh, what used to be called Norris World, Steve Morris World, 25 years ago, when we had Surplan and we had the Network Southeast. We've now got transport for the southeast, but no regional planning structures, no regional plan here. On the other hand, in those days, there was no London mayor, no London plan, uh, and no real London integration. There's now a very good London integration. So London's gone up in 25 years, and the southeast's gone down. I do have a proposal for how to spend the one million, and it was related very well to the point was said about looking at non-London rail services. If Transport South East wants to do something really valuable, uh, is to spend that money on a study of timetables particularly and networks for non-London orbital rail routes. That could be a very valuable contribution. I can think of several of those routes and nobody else will do it. Uh, Rupert Walker and Network South East, sorry, uh, sorry, Network Rail won't and there are no franchisees here. Franchisees won't do it. I don't believe the department will do it. So, so can so I leave that you, with you? So the question is, is that a role for Transport for the South East? Well, I think it is. Not, I think it okay. was really for, for Mr. Mr. Smith and perhaps Mr. Walker. But I do think that point was very valuable raised. And I think if they want to spend their one million, you could do well to have a full study of non-London rail services, South Coast, Anthony, North Downs and is others. That, is that an area where they should be spending their money? Um, it might be one of the areas, yes. I wouldn't say that's the absolute priority. I think if you look at the transport needs of the South East overall, I think the Lower Thames Crossing comes out as an absolutely crucial bit of infrastructure, as does that awkward southwest corner of the M25. Um, there was a brilliant research study recently. I can't remember who did it, but it said basically the M25 is, is full, it's going to get fuller, and there's no obvious solution. Okay. Discuss. Well, that's not a transport policy. It's just a sort of abnegation of discussion. Something's got to change. And if you build a third runway at Heathrow, it's all going to grind to a halt. And so I think the road infrastructure and the rail infrastructure need equal attention. We're going to be talking about digital and, and, and technology uh, a bit later on, but is, is road pricing in, in the mix in the future for you, um, Anthony? Um, thankfully, I'm not paid to have a view on that, but um, clearly some f there needs to be some radical thinking about how you access the rail network and creating an income stream for it. It's very interesting recently, driving down the A303 to the West Country, 
it's absolutely disgusting. The lack of facilities is appalling. You know, it's not great. And if you haven't got an income stream coming from your roads, which can build decent facilities that people are willing to pay for, you end up with squalor by the roadside. And I don't think that's what the South East should look like. Got a question here and a question at the back there. So far away, yeah? OK, thank you. My name's uh, Sally Pavey. I'm a trustee for CPRE Sussex. Um, the one thing I haven't heard is um, affordability for the consumer, for the people who are going to travel on these lovely, lovely new railways and new carriages. Affordability. It costs me mm. less to fly to Alicante out of Gatwick than it does for me to go to work in London. So um, although it may be a national thing, I would have thought that uh, the transport focus would be looking at affordability mm. Anthony, for the residents. Is that in your face. consultation today? Yes, it is. And it's very much one of the things that we've kicked off today with the Rail Delivery Group is looking at, afford not affordability, but it's value for money. Because you're cheap, so my expensive, and vice versa. I think it's very dangerous to talk about expensive fares to a degree. It's value for money that's key, is that people feel they're getting value for money from the fares that they're buying. And if you don't feel that you're getting that, well, something's wrong, mm -hmm. obviously. But I think that the way you pay also for rail fares doesn't help. You know, the annual season ticket, when you know, is, is 10 years out of date already. We need something a bit more modern in a way of paying for things, which will help people access better value for money, I think. Yeah, but on the buses, what about... Uh, 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 is, is that an issue for you on the buses? Um, they, they were free today, obviously, but... Absolutely. No, I mean, again, I think it's it's value for money, and that's that's the key one there. And it's, it's a little bit of the reason when I was talking there about some of our frustration is the amount of it additional resource we're putting in just to stand still and clearly that gives even less scope to uh, offer even more attractive fares and even better value for money so a real problem for us question at the back yeah chris todd from campaign for better transport um just a comment really to start with was that we've heard give us really a question as well don't yeah, forget yeah, nothing about walking and cycling in this and yet there's a strategic need for massive improvements in walking and cycling for the economy in terms of the nhs but also in terms of lost productivity in many cities. I, re I read a report about that recently. But the question is, people have been talking about investing in the infrastructure on rail and road, but no one's talked about traffic reduction. Is there any element of looking at traffic reduction with this because of the impacts um, or the implications of, of continued growth on rail and road is continued increase in carbon emissions and air pollution? And those don't seem to be getting a look in at all today. Okay, uh, Richard, is that, is that something which uh, is likely in your scenario? I mean, obviously, sustainability is a, is a very important issue, but I think in, a, in our scenario, um, th th there's nothing that suggests that a traffic is likely to go anywhere else uh, apart from via the southeast, um, and there's nothing to suggest um, that road freight, as long as we like our just in time supply chains and we like our shops full of the goods that we like when we like them full. Um, that doesn't suggest there's going to be a particular change in the way things are at the moment. OK, uh, Anthony? I think it's a very good point and good, well said about walking because the most neglected form of transport on the planet and the best one. But the um, traffic reduction, it's got to happen because of air quality. It's as simple as that. Something has to happen. And I think also that gives transport for the South East a very unique... There's a window at the moment to get things done, which I think would otherwise be incredibly difficult to do. Air quality affects everyone and you can't escape it. Mm. And therefore something has to be done. And Dave, I think that's a very powerful argument. Dave, you mentioned the need to get more of your passengers onto public transport. Presumably that's, that's driven by this sustainability uh, uh, requirement. It is indeed. And also the, uh, the fact that the, the broader network in the surrounding uh, locality doesn't have the resilience and is increasing going to be uh, peak if it's not already um, is, at is, the moment. Is cycling to Southampton Airport a, a reality? Do people do it? Is it... Is it, is it, is it uh, staff do, and um, picking up on the point about um, the price of tickets, you know, um, Ryanair, I know I've got a pretty aggressive along with other low-cost carriers, but, you know, most people still want to have some form of vehicle to take their hand baggage yeah. with at the end of the day, but we have very small numbers of people who do want to cycle with their baggage. Anthony. The unseen thing here is coach travel. It's a real shame that coach travel doesn't give more prominence in transport planning and the discussions because it can fill in the gaps where rail, rail is expensive to build and it's inflexible to run. Coach travel is very flexible and Heathrow are looking very creatively now at how you can get more people going to Heathrow by coach. And I think that might answer some of the questions about how to get more people to Southampton because they can't all come by car. There'll never be enough car okay. parking. F final point, we bang out the time, we're going to go off for tea. One word, uh, what is the word that you would describe uh, this transport uh, for the South East strategy? We heard challenging, we heard integrated. What are your words, Richard? What, what words are you associated with the vision? 
Uh, maintaining fluidity. Okay, that's, that's two. Um, Dave? <laughs> I'm going to go for two as well. Um, future focus. Okay. Uh, I guess, uh, Ed? I guess it? challenging, um, <clears throat> but possible. Challenging and possible. Anthony, what about yourself? On time today, investment for tomorrow. Goodness, that's at least six. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much to our panel. A round of applause to uh, Anthony, to Dave, Richard and Edward. Thank you very much indeed.